Val Wood. Today is launch day of my new novel, The Lonely Wife. Normally, I would be meeting many of you face to face, but we are not living in normal times. And so we were made what I think is a wonderful alternative arrangement. I have had the support of two incredible actors, Jessica Duffy and Annie Kirkman, who have agreed to read and perform the first two chapters of The Lonely Wife, bringing the characters and situation to life. I do hope you enjoy their performance and I look forward to seeing you again in some happier and normal times. Bye bye. The Lonely Wife by Val Wood. Chapter One. London, 1850. Beatrix eased off her slippers and slid her feet beneath her petticoats on the small sofa in her bedroom, tucked a cushion behind her back, and, with an idle, contented sigh, picked up her book. There was something rather satisfying about a book held in one's hand and a whole afternoon of reading to look forward to. She glanced towards the window and saw that rain was still streaming down the glass, obliterating the London street scene and the gated garden in the square below. Wednesday. She would have been meeting her friend and confidant, Sophia Hartley, for their fortnightly afternoon tea engagement today, but they had both cried off. Beatrix, because of the vile weather. And Sophia, because she had said in the note that she'd sent with the boy that she had a dreadful summer cold and couldn't face coming out in the rain. Beatrix reached for a box of bonbons on the small table beside her one she was saving for such a day as this, and was about to pop a sweet in her mouth. When Dora's soft knock came on the door and the young maid opened it. Miss Beatrix, she said quietly. Yes, Dora. Beatrix glanced across at the carriage clock on her mantelpiece. Your mother, Mrs Fawcett, has requested your presence. Dora? who had only been in this first place of employment for three months, hadn't yet achieved the confidence to know how the mistress of the house, or her daughter either for that matter, should be referred to. She's what? Beatrix gave a mischievous grin. Requested my presence. We're rather formal today, aren't we? Yes, miss, we are. I told her that you were staying at home this afternoon because of the weather. Yes, I'm sorry about that, Dora. You'll have missed the visit to your mother. We'll see if we can rearrange a day for another time. Thank you kindly, Miss Beatrix, Dora said gratefully. Ma wouldn't expect me in this downpour in any case. Beatrix nodded and picked up her book again. She had asked Dora to accompany her on the last two occasions when she'd been out and given her an hour off to visit her own mother whilst she and her friends took tea. If she didn't ask a maid to go with her, then her mother would insist on escorting her. But, Miss? What? Beatrix looked up. Does my mother want something? I'm trying to read. Your mother, that is, Mrs Fawcett, specially said... I know my mother's name, Dora. Beatrix sighed and tried to be patient. What is it that she wants? Your presence, Miss. Or at least it's your father who wants it and he asked your mother to send up for you. Oh, for heaven's sake, Beatrix muttered, putting her feet down and back into her slippers before she stood up, the skirts of her morning gown swaying. Why didn't he come up himself? It's not as if we're living in a mansion. Hmm, Dora's expression told her otherwise, and she supposed that it would seem so to the young girl, considering the tiny terraced house she had come from, within 30 minutes walk from this house in Russell Square. I don't suppose you know what he wants, she asked looking in the gilt-framed mirror, patting her tousled curls. No, miss. Dora's own reflection, her straight hair and lopsided cap, made Beatrix reach up her hand to pull the cap straight. He went in to see Mrs Fawcett in the sitting room just after receiving the afternoon post, and they had a fresh pot of tea. Really? Beatrix glanced at the clock again. Not yet three o'clock and they were having tea. 
Her parents were normally predictable and had tea at four. And why didn't they ask her if she'd like to join? Dora hadn't said there was any hurry, so she hunted for a bookmark to keep the place in the novel she was reading. Not that it was terribly interesting, she mused. A gothic novel written in several parts, as many were nowadays, but not keeping her full attention. She might hunt out something else later. Perhaps Dickens. He never failed to hold her interest, and it was alleged that he took the plots from his own life. She closed the door behind her and walked slowly down the stairs. Her mother must have heard her, for she came out of the study, much to Beatrix's astonishment, as she rarely entered the sanctity of her husband's room and stood waiting at the bottom of the stairs. She began to whisper, now you must listen carefully before you think about giving an answer. Her voice dropped even lower as she leaned towards Beatrix's ear. Don't give your immediate I can't hear you, Mama. What did you say? Have you got a sore throat? Her mother shook her head and went on murmuring. Just listen and, and don't worry. It might be better than... I don't know what you're saying, Mama. Is father in his study? Yes. I'll go in. She knocked sharply on her father's door, but didn't open it until she heard his tobacco-thickened voice instructing her to enter. Father, she said. Is mother all right? She seems rather agitated. Oh, well, he sighed, leaning back in his chair. Oh, that's your mother all over. Any little change and Mrs Fawcett thinks the whole world will fall apart. <laughs> Beatrix frowned. And has something changed? Oh, sit down, Beatrix. He indicated a chair with the stem of his pipe. We have a proposition to think on. Have we? She lowered herself into the battered leather chair. And does mother not like it? Whether her mother liked it or not wasn't relevant in any case, she thought. Whatever the proposition was, if her father thought it suitable, applicable or valid, then that is what it would be, no matter her opinion on the matter. She interlocked her fingers and waited. Waited whilst her father found his tinderbox and matches, filled his pipe and tamped down the tobacco before lighting it, then waited again for the hemp and tobacco to begin to smoulder. He drew on it carefully until a satisfactory curl of smoke rose from the bowl. He could have done this whilst he was waiting for me to come downstairs, she contemplated, unless, of course, he thinks that I like to watch the theatre a bit, which I don't. Nasty, choking performance. Her father gave a grunt, which she supposed was the answer to the question she had asked, and then turned to her. Not every father of daughters would ask their opinion on an important matter, he began, but it behoves me to do so as I have only one daughter. Had my son, your brother Thomas, been here, I might have discussed it with him first, but as he is away in Ireland, <laughs> he rumbled on. Why is it that my parents feel the need to explain relationships? Beatrix considered touchily. I know that Thomas is my brother and is presently abroad, just as I know that he's my father's son and that my mother is also Thomas's mother. I also know that I am an only daughter. I really don't feel the need for further clarification of our happy family. And what subject is giving you concern, father? She asked passively, given the fact that you don't really need another opinion on it. Well, uh, it was this letter which came today. He reached across his desk to pick up an envelope. The bright red wax seal on the back was broken, but Beatrix could still make out the imprint of a crest. Her father turned the envelope over several times before adding, this is the second letter following two face-to-face -face meetings and will shortly require an answer. And is this important matter something I can help you with, father? as your son is away in Ireland and I, your only daughter, happen to be at home today. She couldn't resist the little cynical dig, even though knowing that he wouldn't notice. But he lifted his head and looked at her rather sharply, and she wondered if perhaps she'd gone a step too far. Then, after observing her momentarily, he asked, Why? Where would you normally be at this time of day? Only out for tea with friends, father. 
But today we cancelled because of the rain and Sophia Hartley's being rather unwell. I see, he murmured. Does your mother escort you? No, I generally take Dora, our housemaid Dora, she clarified, in case he had forgotten or hadn't noticed they had a new maid. She's rather young to be your escort, he mumbled. Not much more than a child, even younger than you are. I believe she is 14, father, and I had my 18th birthday in July, if you recall. She fingered her slender gold necklace. You and Mama gave me this. He grunted again. There's nothing wrong with my memory, he answered. But there are many ruffians in London streets and a young maid such as Doris wouldn't be a match against them. So you must keep a scarf at your neck to cover that necklace when going out. Just strangle me by, she thought. But she was relieved that he didn't insist that her mother should accompany her instead. For she would be much less of a match for a band of ruffians than Dora, if by chance they should ever come across any. Dora and I always take great care, Father, and do not enter any disreputable areas. She was aware that Dora did when visiting her family, but the girl insisted that many people living in the back streets of London were good, hard-working people, and though others were unable to earn an honest living, it didn't make them thieves. Beatrix believed her, though perhaps her father wouldn't. You were saying, father? She pointed to the letter in his hands. Something important? He gazed down at her, and she thought for a few seconds he had a certain unease in his expression. Ah, yes. Yes, indeed. He looked up at her, and then down again, and mumbled, Well, it does concern you, which is why I asked your mother to ask you to come down concerns me. He nodded. Uh, your mother isn't keen, but I think it excellent, and I'm sure that you will too once you've uh, given it some thought. <laughs> she waited. This was the usual style of her father. Sometimes he took so long pondering over an issue that by the time he had made up his mind about it, the matter had passed him by and was no longer applicable or of his concern. And she prompted. He looked at her again, as if he'd only just remembered that she was included in this discussion. Um, yes, he said firmly, handing her the envelope. A proposal of marriage, he announced. An excellent prospect, exceptional credentials, good family. You won't do better than that. Take it from me, you really won't. Chapter Two. With parted lips, Beatrix gazed at her father, who kept his eyes firmly lowered and puffed on his smouldering pipe. She swallowed and looked down at the envelope, held lightly between her fingers. She might have thought it a joke, except that her father never made any jest. Never in her life had she heard him utter anything in the least humorous, a tease or a flippant quip. It was not in his nature so to do, so she knew he was deadly serious now. She slid the letter from the envelope, glancing up at her father again as she did so. It was written on thick parchment, the kind one might receive from a bank or lawyer's office. Certainly not the sort of fine paper a young woman might expect to contain a proposal of marriage or terms of endearment. But here indeed, as she cast her eyes over the contents, is what it was. A proposal, but without blandishment. This was from someone who, she was inclined to think, had never even met her, but had received assurances of her suitability as a wife. Father, she croaked and then cleared her throat. <clears throat> Father, she began again. I have never heard of this man, this Charles Neville Dawley. Who, who is he and why does he, why would he offer me marriage? Well, there is no reason why you would have heard of him. You don't move in the circles where you might meet young men. Her father drew heavily on his pipe. But I can tell you his pedigree and how he came to hear of you, of us, your family. <laughs> this is going to be very long-winded, Beatrix thought. 
There will be a long summary of father's acquaintances. Not friends, for I don't believe he has any. Only people he knew when he worked at the bank. My mother has a few from when she was young. And cousins too, although I'm not aware that they correspond very often. She has one or two connections through various ladies circles, but to my knowledge, there is no one close. Father wouldn't like that. They live very private lives. I sometimes feel that I was born into the wrong family. She was on the whole a very positive, cheerful person. She and the friends she'd met at boarding school in Surrey, who lived in London, often talked and laughed at the silliest things, things that would be beyond the understanding of their parents if they should ever happen to hear them. When I was at the bank, her father began. Yeah, what did I tell you? Beatrix often had conversations with herself, asking questions and giving answers. I knew that would be where it began. More to the point, he continued, it was when I was about to retire from the bank. I, I retired early, if you recall, after your grandfather died. Beatrix nodded. When her paternal grandfather died at the great age of 91, he left his only son enough money and property to ensure that he could give up his position as manager at a London bank and live in comfort for the rest of his days, although not in luxury. She had watched her mother deteriorate in manner and spirit once her husband began to spend his time at home, and she guessed that much of her pleasure in having the house to herself and being able to go out whenever she wished, without having to explain herself to anyone, had soon completely dissolved. I joined several gentlemen's clubs and philosophical societies. Her father leaned back on his chair as if in contemplation. I didn't want my brain to disintegrate because of lack of use, you understand. I needed stimulation and motivation and I therefore chose from such establishments the ones I considered could offer those requirements. Beatrix swallowed a yawn. It was warm in the study. Her father rarely opened a window. He hated draughts and with the warmth of the fire in the grate and thug of tobacco smoke which was making her eyes water she felt she could quite easily nod off to sleep. She roused herself. <clears throat> And so this was where you met Mr. Dawley, was it? He looked at her, and as she had thought when she saw his glazed expression, he'd gone off on his own little trail of reminiscences, completely forgetting the starting point. The offer of marriage from an unknown suitor. He sat up, flustered. No, no. Um, at least, yes. His father, uh, not to the son, although young Dawley was old enough to join the club, which he did eventually. Well, that's something to be thankful for, she considered. Although I was beginning to think that I might marry this unknown old man, for he would soon be in his grave and I would be my own mistress. She and her friends often had conversations about marriage, deciding that they would like to become old men's darlings and subsequently rich and merry young widows. <laughs> Dawley is also in banking, but much higher up the ladder than I ever was or was likely to be. <laughs> Her father continued. Private banking, you know. Uh, he told me that his son was looking for a suitable wife. Not immediately, but a few years hence when he would come into an inheritance. I thought nothing of it at the time. This would have been about, what, three years ago? He added. When you were too young to consider. Is this how it works? Beatrix thought uneasily. Where does my mother come into this? Did she have an opportunity to meet a young man who might be suitable as a marriage partner for her daughter? Her only daughter, who would have been barely 15 at the time. What was her mother trying to say as she whispered to her at the bottom of the stairs? And how old is Mr. Dory Jr? she asked. Several years older than I am, I'm deducing, if he was old enough to join your club when you first met his father. The father pursed his lips. Oh, um, it'll be in his early thirties now, I would think. A good age for marriage. Got over that first flush of youthful exuberance, I imagine. <laughs> old then? Past the flush of youthful exuberance? Is thirty the end point? Did my father ever have that? Did his father? My grandfather obviously didn't spend much on excesses if he was able to leave so much to his son. Is that 
the whole point of life, accruing money and property to pass on to the next in line. She remembered her grandfather, although she hadn't met him more than half a dozen times. He had left her five pounds in his will. Her father said she couldn't draw it until she was 21. She had been mildly disappointed, for she had planned that when she was a little older, she would buy some new dresses and perhaps a bonnet or two, and would meet friends for coffee and cake at a grand hotel. But now she reconsidered. If she married anyone, not just this Mr Dawley, would her money then become his? Perhaps she should wait until she had celebrated her coming of age and could spend her money, her five pounds, as she wished. I'm not sure if I'm ready for marriage yet, father. And I would like a choice in the matter. I'd like to meet a young man and find that we each have some qualities that appeal. The father's forehead creased a little as he considered what she'd said. But isn't that exactly what I've been doing on your behalf? <laughs> I surely must know best what my daughter requires in a marriage. And believe me, my dear, you won't, as I said earlier, do better than young Dawley. But you haven't told me of his attributes, father. I don't know anything of his manner, his kindness to others, of how he makes a living, for instance, or his hopes for the future. Only that he is due an inheritance, and that tells me nothing about him. Her father leaned towards her and lowered his voice. It tells you, Beatrix, that he will become very rich. He is due to inherit a substantial country estate. But what does he look like? Her voice rose as she became even more uneasy. Is he tall, short, portly or thin, dark haired or fair? Have you actually met him? What does he know of me? He surely wouldn't wish to marry a stranger. His father and I have exchanged views, and yes, I met young Dawley on one occasion, and he has seen you. It seems you were both at a um, coming-of-age party last year. You were not introduced, but he asked who you were. Mm, Susanna Cummings' party, she thought. There were so many people there, it was impossible to be introduced to everyone. A total fiasco, as far as I was concerned. I lost track of where any of my friends were, and didn't meet one single interesting person to talk to. Mother came with me. I must ask her if she remembers Mr. Dawley. She stood up. I must ask you to excuse me, Father. I'm afraid I'm developing a headache. She fanned herself with her hand. It's uncommonly warm in here. I'll leave the door open, shall I? Um, oh, yes, very well. We'll, uh, we'll speak later. I realise it's, it's a lot to take in immediately, need, need some thought. Uh, yes, definitely needs thought. Uh, for the best though, I'd say. She opened the door and felt the rush of cool air from the hall come in. She turned. Where did you say this country estate is, Father? Why, I didn't say, did I? But it's in the north of England, in uh, Yorkshire to be exact, somewhere overlooking the Humber. Beatrix sat on the bottom step of the staircase, considering. The north of England? I don't even know where Yorkshire is. It's where the mills and coal mines are, surely, so how can it overlook the Humber? The Humber's an estuary. Oh, I don't want to live there. When would I see my friends? My mother? Would we have a carriage to come back to London, or would we have to travel by train? Do they have trains in the north? I know. Miss Emily Bronte. She wrote about the area, as did her sisters. They lived somewhere on the moors. Wuthering Heights, that was it. My father said I shouldn't read it. I borrowed it. Oh dear, did I give it back? It belonged to Marianne Foster, I think. It was very bleak, I recall. So sad that the author has died. I believe there's only Charlotte left. The sitting room door opened and her mother peeped out. On seeing Beatrix sitting there, a small smile touched her mouth and she beckoned her silently. You used to sit on the bottom of the step when you were a little girl, she said softly. He used to say you were busy thinking. <laughs> Beatrix nodded. Yes, she murmured. I called it my thinking step. 
for when I talked things through with myself, things I didn't always understand. Childhood can be very worrying. They sat opposite each other on either side of the fireplace. Neither spoke for a few minutes, and then her mother broke the silence. You don't have to agree to the, um, suggestion, but there are reasons why you might wish to. Beatrix looked up from her contemplation of the gleaming fire irons. Don't I? What are the reasons? Am I allowed to know? It is my life in the balance, after all. Am I being melodramatic? She wondered when she saw her mother's eyebrows rise and her eyes gleam. Since when have women been allowed to determine what should happen in their lives? Mrs Fawcett asked between barely parted lips. I beg your pardon, Beatrix. Has something passed me by without my noticing? How very remiss of me. Mother! She was alarmed. Her mother was quiet, placid and rarely gave her opinion even if asked for it. Not that anyone did, apart from Cook or the housekeeper. What is it? Do you know this man, this... Mr. Dawley? Father must have told you about him and his proposal. Her mother stared into the smouldering coals of the low fire. He did, she agreed. Just this afternoon, when the second post arrived. You didn't know before today? Was the subject never mentioned? Not to me. Your father and Mr. Dawley Senior have apparently discussed it at length for quite some time, and Mr. Dawley's son has been told that you seem to be the most desirable prospect so far. Beatrix was almost speechless, but recovered enough to say, Father said that young Mr. Dawley was at Susanna Cummings' party last year. Do you remember him? Her mother shook her head. There were far too many guests there for me to recall, she shuddered. Such a dreadful occasion. We came home early, if you remember. We did, Beatrix agreed. I heard later that Susanna didn't enjoy it much either. Her parents had arranged it. It was held for her to meet people. It was a search party for marriage prospects in the worst possible taste, her mother exclaimed. Simply dreadful. <laughs> However, what you must understand, Beatrix, is that your father is doing this with your best interests at heart. He's only doing what he's expected to do. It is how things are done. Like it or not, he is simply following a pattern laid down over decades, no, centuries. And there is really nothing that we can do about it.